Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Taylor Robinson from Akron, Ohio, who was 19 years old when she was murdered. On May 3rd, 2013, Taylor's mom dropped her off for her overnight shift at a home where she worked as a home health aide. But when her client's mother returned home the next morning, Taylor was gone, and no one ever saw her again. Four months later, her skeletal remains were found in a park. But 10 years later, the person responsible for whatever happened to Taylor has never been found. And her family is still desperately searching for answers. This is Taylor's story. For the family of Taylor Robinson, the past almost 10 years of their lives have been consumed by their quests to find her killer. Before she was murdered, she was a bright young woman with her whole life ahead of her. Yet her promising future was cut short by a brutal and senseless act. Despite a frantic search for answers, her killer has never been found. Her family has made it their life's mission to find justice for her, persevering through countless dead ends and frustrating roadblocks. Despite the passage of time, they have never given up hope that one day the killer will be brought to justice and Taylor's memory will be honored. Taylor was born on January 28, 1994 in Akron, Ohio. As a child, her family described her as quote-unquote a busy bee. In an episode of Investigation Discovery Channel's Still a Mystery, her mom Carmilla said that Taylor was the kind of child that looked out for others that were being bullied or picked on. She was a kind of protector of those who needed a friend. As a teen, Taylor attended Kenmore High School, where she was a very active student who played several sports, including volleyball, softball, and track. And she also played football. You would think that playing multiple sports would have kept Taylor busy enough, but she also volunteered as an office worker at her high school, Taylor was known for being hardworking and ambitious, which is why she was able to juggle multiple sports and still find the time to volunteer. It's clear that she was determined to make the most out of her high school career and took full advantage of all the opportunities that were presented to her. After graduating from high school, she started working at a local clothing store, and she also started working as a home health aide. Taylor's dream, though, was to become a nurse. Her family said that she always wanted to help people. And so while Taylor juggled both jobs, she kept her sights on her ultimate goal of pursuing a career in nursing. She began taking classes at Kent State University and chose to pursue a career as a neonatal nurse. Despite the challenges of having to juggle two jobs and her studies, Taylor remained focused on her dream of becoming a nurse. And even with her busy schedule, Taylor was still active in her church and spent her Sundays volunteering teaching Sunday school. For her mom, Carmilla, she said that Taylor wasn't just her daughter. She was her best friend. By all accounts, Taylor was a kind person who was well-liked. When she wasn't going to school, she was volunteering at her church and working with adults and children with special needs. Taylor was known for her selflessness and commitment to others, and she was passionate about helping those in need. And her mom said that she was always willing to go an extra mile to make sure that other people were taken care of. By 2013, life for Taylor was going well. She was just 19 years old, but she was well on her way to achieving all of her goals. And that's why what happened in May of that year is all the more tragic. On May 3rd, 2013, a Friday, 
Taylor, who was still living at home with her mom, spent the day studying. That night, she was scheduled to work at her job as a home health aide. It was going to be an overnight shift for a little girl who she cared for while her mother went to work. And dropping Taylor off at work was something that her mom always did. And so from what is described about that night, everything seemed normal. Taylor was scheduled to be at work at 10 p.m. I'm not sure how far she lived from her client, but she and her mom left their home and headed there. According to Carmilla, she dropped her daughter off right at 10 p.m. She told Still a Mystery that she pulled up in the driveway and kissed Taylor, and she told her that she loved her. Taylor told her that she loved her too, and then she gathered her things and got out of the car. Carmilla said that she watched as she walked up the stairs and went into the house. At the time, she had no way of knowing that it would be the last time that she saw her daughter. And once Taylor arrives at her client's home, her mother leaves for her shift. And no one knows what happened next, but the following morning, the little girl who Taylor was caring for's mother came back from work around 7 a.m. And when she went inside her home, she found her daughter alone. Taylor was nowhere in sight. And at first, understandably, the mother was upset. I mean, she had left her daughter in Taylor's care, and when she came back, she was gone. About 15 minutes after the mother of the little girl got home, Carmilla arrived to pick Taylor up. Carmilla said that when she pulled up to the house, the mother told her that Taylor wasn't there. And she was, of course, confused because she had dropped Taylor off there and watched her go inside. Now, the woman told her that Taylor must have just left in the middle of her shift. The problem was she had left her shoes, her coat, and other personal belongings inside the house. Carmilla said that immediately she began to panic because she knew her daughter would not do something like this. She was a responsible caregiver, and so she would never have just left a special needs child at home on purpose. Carmilla immediately began calling Taylor's phone, but was going straight to voicemail, and that only worsened her fears. She decided that she would just go home and then try to call Taylor's friends, now, even though she knew her daughter would not have just left her client, maybe someone knew where she was. But after speaking to her friends, she found out that her worst fears were becoming a reality because no one had seen Taylor and no one had spoken to her. She knew that something was very wrong. And so Carmilla called the Akron Police Department to report Taylor missing. From the beginning, Carmilla made it clear to police that Taylor was not a runaway. She told police that she was a good girl, a student who worked and never got into any trouble. She didn't fit the profile of a runaway. And once police began to investigate what happened and speak to other people who knew Taylor, they agreed. She didn't seem like the kind of girl who would just leave. And once they learned that her shoes and coat were left behind, they were even more convinced that something likely had happened to Taylor. After speaking to her family and friends, investigators focused on the home of the client that she had been working for that night. They searched the home for any evidence, but they found nothing inside. There was no sign of forced entry, and there was no sign that a struggle had taken place either. Despite their thorough search, the investigators uncovered no clues that could shed light on the incident. But police still believed early on that Taylor potentially had been abducted from the home and that she had opened the door for whoever it was. The first big break in the case came when police got Taylor's phone records. Now, determining who she spoke to last or who she may have been texting was an important step in figuring out what may have happened to her. By reviewing Taylor's phone records, police were able to gain valuable insights into the events leading up to her disappearance. 
And Taylor's phone records revealed that the last number she called, she spoke to at least two times. And this gave police an idea of who she was talking to right before she went missing and a possible lead on a potential suspect. So police learned that shortly after arriving at work at 10 p.m., Taylor spoke to someone on the phone two times. And after tracing the number, they discovered that it belonged to an ex-boyfriend of hers. Investigators reached out to him so they could find out about his conversation with Taylor and find out if he knew where she was or what happened to her. But it was clear from the beginning that he was not going to be helpful finding Taylor. When police bring him in for questioning, he immediately lawyers up and refuses to speak to police. Police have never publicly identified who this ex-boyfriend is, and they have never said that he was a suspect or even a person of interest. But the fact that he refused to speak to police does make you wonder why. I mean, you would think that if you were the last person to speak to someone who is now missing and you had nothing to do with what happened, then you would be willing to speak to police about what you know. But Taylor's ex refused to do that, and so police had no choice but to move on with their investigation. They decided to turn back to Taylor's phone to see if there was anything else in those records that could give them a lead. They knew that the last person to speak to her was her ex not too long after she had began her shift. But after that, the next activity on her phone didn't happen until 5 a.m. the following day, May 4th. The message from Taylor's phone was sent to a friend. And the message was asking for a favor, but the request was not specific and the friend was asleep, so they did not respond to Taylor's text. But after that, there was no activity on her phone. Fifteen minutes after Carmilla arrived at her job to pick her up, at 7.30 a.m., Taylor's phone was turned off and it was never turned back on. By the next week, Taylor's family was panicking. Investigators were having trouble finding any evidence of what happened to her. They had somewhat of a timeline from her phone records, but there was no way to know what time she left the home, and most importantly, who she left with. Their theory was that Taylor may have been abducted from the home, but they needed evidence to support that. On May 6th, three days after Taylor disappeared, the FBI announced that they were joining the investigation and search for Taylor. The Akron PD had reached out to them to ask for assistance. Early on, they knew that they were going to need help in figuring out this mystery, and so they didn't wait. They called in the FBI right away, hoping that with the additional resources, they would be able to find Taylor. In the meantime, her family had begun their own search for her. The local news had already picked up the story about Taylor's disappearance, and the word around Akron was spreading fast. The family organized searches and passed out hundreds of flyers, hoping for any information about where Taylor was. They created a Facebook page, and they began holding vigils to bring awareness and pray for her safe return. They were hopeful that Taylor was still alive, and so they were determined to get her story out there. The family wanted to do anything they could to make sure that Taylor was found. They figured that the more people who knew about her story and knew what was happening, that the more likely it was that someone would come forward with information to help locate her. Even as days turned from weeks to months, They continued their fight to find her, but the leads had dried up and investigators were having trouble locating information. All of the traditional methods of finding a missing person were being exhausted, and so investigators had to resort to more creative means like retracing her steps and interviewing friends and family and using social media to find clues that they just couldn't find. But 
after speaking to her friends and searching through her social media, they found nothing except that Taylor was a normal teenager. There was nothing in her life that led them to believe that she was in trouble or involved in anything suspicious. And so the question about where Taylor was and who would want to abduct her or hurt her remained. Four months after she vanished from her job, all of her family's worst nightmares would come true. On May 3rd, 2013, Taylor Robinson vanished from the home where she worked as a home health aide. When her client's mother returned the following morning, she found Taylor gone. Calls to her phone went straight to voicemail, and so her family filed a missing persons report. Within days, the FBI was involved, but leads dried up quickly, and investigators were finding little information. Months after she went missing, the search for Taylor came to a devastating end. In the weeks following Taylor's disappearance, her family had been searching for her tirelessly. Once people in and around Akron learned about Taylor's disappearance, they too joined her family in those searches. During a vigil for Taylor a few weeks after she vanished, her stepfather, Jeff Rucker, spoke and said, quote, It's not just about our baby. We never thought this would happen in our household. This could happen to anybody, you know. You never know, no matter how much you prepare for it, no matter how much you talk to your kids, anything can happen. Taylor's disappearance had a huge impact on the community, and people wanted to help her family in any way that they could. Her stepfather also highlighted the fact that tragedies like Taylor's can happen to anyone, no matter how much you try to prevent it. Volunteers who joined in on searches wanted to let Taylor's family know that they were not by themselves. Quote, we want the family to know you're not in this by yourself. You're not in it alone, one of the search organizers told Fox 8. And Taylor's family, especially her mom Carmilla, was grateful for those members of the community. She told Fox 8, quote, they treat Taylor as if she is theirs and they are looking for their own. I just want to say thank you and just know how grateful we really are. The volunteers felt an immense amount of empathy for Taylor's family, and they wanted to be able to provide support during that difficult time. By joining in on and organizing searches, they were able to show their solidarity and let the family know that they were not alone. In June 2013, her family held a vigil and fundraiser. Their goal was to raise money to hire a private investigator. Despite the FBI's involvement, after almost two months, the investigation had not really gone anywhere. The FBI had conducted its own searches, but they had been unable to find any evidence or fresh leads. So Taylor's family felt like it was time to get someone else to help investigate Taylor's disappearance. Private investigators are often hired when the police are unable to find any significant leads in an investigation. Taylor's family felt that bringing in a private investigator was their best chance to find Taylor. And as luck would have it, a private investigator saw their story and decided that he would help Taylor's family, and all they would need to pay him was a dollar. His name is Tim Dimoff, and after seeing Carmela on the news, he contacted her and offered his services, and then he immediately got to work. While the Akron PD and the FBI continued their investigation, Tim went back to the beginning. He visited the crime scene and interviewed Taylor's family, friends, and coworkers, and through this, he developed a profile of what may have happened to Taylor. He told the Akron Beacon Journal in July 2013 that, quote, basically, I developed a profile of potentially what happened at the scene and tried to nail down what kind of person 
was involved in the criminal behavior. He told the Beacon Journal that through those interviews, he learned that although Taylor, for the most part, had no problems in her life, there were some issues that were going on before she disappeared. And some of those issues involved an ex-boyfriend. He learned that before she went missing, she had been talking to someone who had made her upset and that she had started crying, but she never told her family or friends who that person was that she was speaking to. And it's not clear what that conversation was even about. However, Tim believed that it was possible that this person was involved in her disappearance. Quote, so I believe this person was someone she had a conflict with, and it was taking place before she disappeared. It was not someone who stopped by and got into an argument. It was someone who had an ongoing dispute. Maybe there was information Taylor had that she didn't want revealed, or it could be a relationship issue, Tim said in his interview with The Beacon. After a month of investigating, Tim had come up with a theory of what he believed happened to Taylor that night. He said that he believed that on May 3rd, someone that Taylor knew came to the home where she worked. He said that most likely this was someone that she felt comfortable with, hence why she came to the door without her shoes on. Quote, she definitely knew them quite well. It was someone she had interacted with over months or years. Tim's theory was that whoever this person was either wanted Taylor to do something or say something or not say something, and when she would not agree, they took her from the home. Tim said that he also believed that someone, maybe several people, either witnessed what happened or knew something that could help solve what happened. Quote, We really firmly believe this situation is not a secret. Sometimes a crime happens and the person who is perpetrating the crime is the only one who knows it and they don't share any of their discomfort or threats or what they might do before it happens or after it happens. In this case, I'm very confident there are other people in Akron, Ohio, who know exactly who's responsible for Taylor's disappearance. The information he found led him to the conclusion that this was not a random act of violence, but also that this person likely had not done anything like this before. Quote, I don't believe this is the type of person who has committed murder before or anything like that, but a person who has been engaged in other kinds of confrontations and may be on the edge of maybe other criminal behavior, a control power type person a person who gets out of hand when things don't go their way. In a short period of time, Tim had added a lot to this investigation, having developed a theory that could make a huge difference in the police's investigation. Taylor's family was still hopeful that she was going to be found alive, but Tim wasn't as confident. He knew that there was always a possibility that Taylor would be found alive, that Perhaps she was being held captive. But he told the Beacon Journal that based on his experience as a cop and investigator, it was more likely that Taylor was no longer alive. Four months after Taylor's disappearance, everyone's worst nightmare came true. On Monday, September 9th, 2013, two people were out for a hike in Cuyahoga Valley National Park when they made a gruesome discovery. Scattered along the trail near the picnic area, they found human remains that included a part of a skull and jawbone. When police arrived at the scene, they found that there were also pieces of clothing, but there was no way to identify if the remains belonged to a man or a woman. However, just two days after the discovery, Investigators held a press conference and made the heartbreaking announcement. The remains found in the park were, in fact, those of Taylor Robinson. The investigators had been able to positively identify the remains through dental impressions. Her family was devastated. They had held out hope that Taylor was going to be found alive right up to the last minute. And now, 
they knew that that wasn't going to happen. During that press conference, Carmilla said, quote, she wasn't a person that deserved this. She was a person that took care of mentally challenged people. She worked in a daycare. She wasn't a child that deserved to have her body end up in a park. Despite her overwhelming grief, Carmilla was at least grateful that they were able to bring Taylor home and that she was no longer lost. And she was thankful to those who found her. But the question of what happened to Taylor was still unanswered. The remains were nothing but bones when they were found, and so there would have to be more DNA testing and an anthropological exam to determine the cause of death and the manner of Taylor's death. For investigators, however, this was being treated as a homicide investigation now, and they needed to find out who was responsible for Taylor's death. Although they could not determine how she died, the condition of the remains indicated that Taylor had been dead for months, likely killed shortly after being abducted. After the remains were found, Tim developed a new part of his theory. The location where she was found told him that whoever carried her body out there may have had help. But investigators still did not know who. They did have a few suspects, but they were unwilling to officially name any of them. They needed more information, and they hoped that a $7,000 reward for information would compel people to start talking. But it didn't, and Taylor's case began to go cold. No one was talking, and investigators had not found enough evidence to charge anyone. Taylor's remains were sent to a university so that they could continue to be tested. However, in the months following the discovery of her remains, there was less and less information about what happened to Taylor. Tim said that they had been able to narrow down their potential suspects to two men that Taylor had been in relationships with. According to him, he had discovered that these men had a history of abuse that included incidents with Taylor and other women. However, he did not name those men, and as far as I could find, police have never confirmed this part of the story. Over the next few years, there was no new information about Taylor's case. Some local news outlets kept up with Carmilla and reported about the case every few years, but there was no significant movement in the case, and it officially became a cold case. In 2020, nearly six years after Taylor's body was found, police announced that they were looking for new leads in the case. They were hoping that after all that time that someone would finally be ready to talk, and so they made a plea for information. But sadly, they were not able to get any information, and so the case remained cold. A year later, the reward for information was raised to $10,000, but even with that boost, no one came forward. As of the recording of this episode, there's been no new information about Taylor's death. Investigators have never released her cause of death, but it it's clear that Taylor was murdered. For almost 10 years now, the murderer has remained free. Whatever happened to Taylor Robinson on May 3rd, 2013 is a real mystery. There are so many unanswered questions, and after almost 10 years, her family is still in the same place that they were when Taylor was found dead. They have done everything that they can to keep Taylor's memory alive and to find her killer. Investigators believe that whoever took Taylor that night knew her and was someone that she felt comfortable with. But this person had bad intentions and ultimately murdered her. Taylor was a young woman who was just trying to follow her dreams and someone in her life decided that they would take that from her. 
This is a case that needs someone to speak up. It's been 10 years, and her family needs this closure. Even though this case is cold, it is still open, and so it's important to continue to share Taylor's story until her killer is found. Taylor Robinson disappeared on May 3rd, 2013, from a home on Kipling Street in Akron, Ohio. She was last seen wearing a white shirt and gray leggings. Her remains were later discovered in Cuyahoga Valley National Park in September 2013. If you have any information about the disappearance and murder of Taylor Robinson, please contact the FBI or the Akron, Ohio Police Department. May Taylor Robinson rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next week with a brand new story. In the meantime, make sure you follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter 